When working with old cars, oftentimes they have old car problems, and a lot of those come from electrical gremlins. Let's talk about some tests that you can use to help figure out the electrical problems in your car. Let's get ready to amp up our skills. So some of the most basic tests that you can do are just basic voltage testing, testing for continuity, uh, testing for voltage drop. We're gonna go over how to check all these things. To do it, I'm just using a simple auto ranging digital multimeter. This is an older Craftsman that I've had for more than 20 years. Uh, I happen to have replaced the probes at one point along their way with a set of replaceable probes that you can use an alligator clip or something into there. Yes, I know that's red on black, but whatever. So if you don't have any of these things, there's gonna be a link in the description where you can find some good units to get you started. And pro tip, don't get hung up on people that say, you gotta have a fluke. They're a nice unit, but there's a reason they cost as much as they do, but that's a story for another day. For demonstration purposes, I'm gonna be using my El Camino. This is a car I know very well, and please don't get hung up that you don't see a battery up here. It's a race car, the battery's at the back, but let's get the hood up first. Let's go to the battery. So in every automotive electrical system, everything starts and ends with the battery. We're gonna be covering 12 volt negative ground in this case, just to make things easier. I know that there are some out there that are positive ground, but we're not gonna get into that. This is basic electrical testing, you ought to know. So first off, voltage testing. Black to negative, red to positive, and you're gonna get a voltage. The meter says 12.53 volts, which tells me the battery has 12 and a half volts and is in good shape. That's an important number to know because when you go around uh, chasing electrical things, that's the number that you're gonna be looking for at all the components. But a voltage test, everyone knows that. Yes, but we gotta start somewhere and that's the basis of every other test we're gonna do. So the next most common test that I do is alternator output. Is it actually putting out voltage? This is where something with a, a clip is handy. Now, on a normal car that has a battery up here, you're gonna test ground right to the battery, but since my battery's at the back, it's too far. But I'm gonna grab hold of my main ground lug, or negative, and with the car running, you wanna to touch the lug at the back of the alternator to make sure that you're getting voltage. The voltage you're looking for while it's running is on these cars, anything 13 and a half to 14.4 voltage is about right where it's supposed to be. Uh, anything less or battery voltage means it's just not charging anything. Sometimes you have to give them a blip of the throttle to get the uh, uh, stator excited, but most of the time when it's running, you should be seeing 13.56 volts and higher. Now, if you're seeing 15 volts, that means your alternator is overcharging. Next up, we're gonna talk about is continuity. Continuity is done using the little ohm thing here. Ohm is basically a measure of resistance of a component, a wire, a whatever. Uh, ohms, kilo ohms, mega ohms, it's a factor of a thousand. Think metric and you're not far off. So if you have resistance in a wire, that could be something like corrosion or older stuff has a ballast resistor in line with the ignition that takes it from 12 volts down to six volts to operate the older point style ignitions. Uh, basically, res resistance is something you're gonna use over and over to verify things. If you've got resistance in a, in a wire that you're not supposed to, that's a problem that needs to be fixed. Uh, blower motors, they use a resistor pack to vary the speed of the blower from low to high. That's another place that you would have a resistance value and it would be okay. So let's uh, do some testing and show you how this works. So first off, we wanna prove a wire is connected. I'm using a piece of just blank wire here. You connect one end to the uh, one end, the other to the other, and there's no real resistance there. The beep lets you know that it's connected. Now, that's an easy way. You can do this without the beep. That's not a big deal. Uh, the beep is when you're quickly testing things, proving that things are connected. Uh, the reason that you would test a wire, for example, is automakers use things called fusible links. Those burn up and power is not moved from one end to the other. It's basically a fail safe. It's basically a fuse, but in wire form that burns slower. So now that I mentioned fuses, you know, you have a fuse that you need to verify is good or bad. You know, if the visual cue isn't there or sometimes the break can be so fine that you can't see it. One to one side, that one's connected, great. But what about one that's actually bad? This is a bad one that I have in my collection. It's connected, it's showing an open loop, 
which is what OL means. So that means that fuse is legitimately bad. Now on the top of fuses, there's often two little test ports that you can see. Now you can use the probes and touch the fuse in the fuse block and verify that the fuse is good or bad while you're sitting there. So that's one way you can test a fuse without pulling it out of the fuse block. All right, so a practical application of this is you wanna verify that your block has a good ground to the frame and to the battery. So I've got my ground hooked up to my ground lug there, and I'm just going to, by touching the intake manifold with the other side of the probe, that proves that I have good continuity from the block, from the engine, through to ground. And that's important because grounds continue to be one of the biggest failure points on cars like this. And it's not so much that the ground has failed as much as the connector has failed or there's the connections got corrosion in the way so when you're doing this stuff you want to take the time to look at the connections for at the battery side as well as the block side and anywhere else that matters if there's large amounts of corrosion that would inhibit or stop the flow of electricity through those components so a bad ground really isn't that hard to fix new battery cables that's not an uncommon thing on cars that are older so let's talk about uh, where you do want resistance. This is an ignition coil, this is an HEI coil, all the same rules apply to oil-filled round coil as well as just about any other coil. So we wanna test the primary side. So between here and here, we want it to be between zero and one ohm. Get my connection on there. We're looking at 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 ohms. So this one is good on the primary side. Now the secondary side is between the little ground lug here and the output of the coil. So let's grab here and there. Here we want to be between 3,000 and 30,000 ohms. Uh, this is all measuring in kilo ohms, so multiply that by 1,000. 7.7 uh, .7 kilo ohms, 7,700 ohms, give or take. So this coil is good. You can do this on every coil that you come across if you're suspecting a no spark situation. Testing the coil is a quick and easy way to rule that out. So for a canister coil, or this is an E-coil, but it's a standalone unit, not in a distributor cap, positive and negative, and you wanna be between the same kind of range, zero and one ohm, right there. And if you wanna test the secondary winding, you unhook the negative, hook it on the output of the coil. Same thing, you wanna be between three and 30, 30 kilo ohms or 3,000 and 30,000 ohms. We're running just good right there. We're now venturing into the realm of a little bit more theoretical stuff, so this should be okay. Let's say that you have a component that you suspect isn't working correctly. You could do two things. You can measure the resistance through the component and verify it against the manual or other source, or you could perform what's called a voltage drop test. Pretend this connector here is connected into something that we suspect is failing. What you would do is with the circuit running, take one probe to the positive side and the other probe to the negative side. So basically you're reaching in there and touching the back side of the connector. You're looking for 0.1 to 0.3 volts of drop is kind of considered the max that is acceptable unless it's something that's got a resistance value like a blower motor or something designed to have resistance in it. But the point is that if you're seeing a uh, higher voltage drop than 0.1 to 0.3, that means that component is likely drawing too much current and has excessive resistance and the downstream components may not be working correctly. This could be things like switches. Think of things that would be downstream. Um, horns, as an example, that's maybe a poor one because they just work whenever they work and they don't when they don't. But point is you could measure the switch and see if it's got excessive voltage drop. Keep that in mind when you're going through things. Be, be willing to check the resistance without the circuit powered on and voltage drop with the circuit powered on and see what you're getting. Now, the last one I wanna talk about is called parasitic draw. This is one of those tests that you would perform. You know, If your car sits and you keep coming out to having a dead battery, there is something that is drawing the battery down. Let's talk about how to perform that. So for parasitic draw, we're basically looking for current or some current that is flowing when the key is off. 
So we're going to want to set our meter to 20 amps. Understand that the meter is basically going to be in line with the battery cable and will be any current that's flowing is going to be going through the meter. So don't do something crazy like try and start the car or something. It's not going to work. So the switch is on, my kill switch down there. And right now we're seeing, whoop, put that guy back in place. We're seeing 0.023 amps of parasitic draw on this car. That could be things in most cars like a radio or some courtesy lamp function, some lamp that's not turning off. Who knows? This is where you'd go to your fuse block and start pulling fuses, looking for a circuit that changes the value here. If you have excessively high draw, an amp or two, that'll draw your battery down pretty darn quick, overnight kind of thing. So if you pull a circuit and see that that drops massively, you know that's the circuit to troubleshoot further and to go down that rabbit hole of making sure that everything is correct, shutting off the way it's supposed to, sensors, who knows what. So this is perfectly acceptable. Typically in the 0.1 to 0.3 amp range, keeps everything happy, radios, power seats, most normal things on cars. So if you see a big number over an amp, that's a problem. Couple of final thoughts. If you're doing electrical testing, you may want to consider putting a battery charger on your car. If you're doing a lot of key on, checking for voltage, key off, various cyclings of the key for a long period of time, your battery may run down a bit further than you'd like and you're getting inconsistent results. So hook your car up to a battery charger. You know, older stuff, you can get by with a smaller one. Uh, new stuff, if you're doing some hardcore electrical troubleshooting, sometimes you need a little bit more amperage. And secondly, uh, there's a checklist in the description, which is my electrical diagnostic checklist that I use to keep myself focused and following a consistent path when going through electrical diagnostic stuff. Check that out, and uh, I know it'll serve you well. And finally, let's get out to the garage and go build something cool. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later.